question. The film you're about to see has been directed by the Fact Hungry Witch, who is a friend of mine, although we haven't known each other long. As the Fact Hungry Witch explained it to me during our long discussions, the film is particularly interested in the struggle to represent different forms of truth. What they present in this film is factual information about the history of engineering. I am proud that we've been able to help to make a film by letting them use the Transport Museum and the London Underground. I'm not interested in the amplification of the British Empire. I'm interested in engineering innovation. Is it possible to separate these points? No, because actually engineering is always dependent on politics, on the mm -hmm. economy, mm -hmm. on social aspects, so you cannot separate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Crystal Palace is actually as much a political endeavor as an engineering feat. I'm very hungry for knowledge, but within that search, I'm aware there are many different sides to the story. The information I present today is motivated by my surprise that the area around Gloucester Road and South Kensington are linked to the Crystal Palace. And through this, they are linked to a lily from the Amazon jungle. Outside house, flying in, greeting Adam with telehandler. Joseph Paxton was born in Bedfordshire on the 3rd of August, 1803. His dad was a poor peasant farmer and he died soon afterwards. When Joseph had finished school, he was sent to work on his brother's farm where he was beaten and starved but not paid. When he was 15, he ran away to be a gardener. He was determined to better himself and he did his very best in every gardening position he got into. He wound up as superintendent of the Chiswick Gardens Arboretum in London. But even there, he was paid less than a pound a week. And he realized if he was going to make any real money, he'd have to go to America. And then he opened the door to the Duke of Devonshire. The Duke was enormously impressed by the enthusiasm, energy of this young man. And although Joseph was only 23, he made him superintendent of the whole gardens of his country home, Chatsworth House in Derbyshire. On his very first day here, Paxson was understandably nervous and het up. In fact, he was so terrified that he got here at 4.30 in the morning, <coughs> before it was light. So what he did was to climb over the wall. He inspected the grounds as far as he could see anything. He set the gardeners to work. He inspected the waterworks. And then he went and had breakfast with Mrs. Gregory, the housekeeper, and met her niece, Sarah Bowne and fell instantly in love. And all that was before nine o'clock in the morning. Later, he married Sarah and they had eight children.
Wouldn't it be great if we had someone like Adam Hart Davis to come on and talk to us about the history of Paxton? In 1837, a traveller brought back a fantastic new lily from Guyana. The people at Kew couldn't get it to grow, but Paxton got hold of a cutting. I am interested in the lily from the Amazon, being the reason Joseph Paxton developed the engineering breakthrough and designed glass houses that were in kit form, enabling them to become the winning formula to house the Great Exhibition of 1851. However, I am not interested in the fact that the lily was offered to be named after the princess soon to become Queen Victoria. It is sickening and indicative of the arrogance of the time. Is it possible to still be interested in how the lily inspired Paxton without having to pay tribute to the Victorian worldview? And he designed a specially heated pool with water wheels to keep the water moving. So it mimicked the swampy rivers of the Amazon basin. In three months, it had 11 leaves and they were five feet across. Even he was amazed at the size. And they were extraordinarily strong. He stood his daughter Annie on one of the leaves and she didn't go through and she didn't sink in. It was quite extraordinary. Now, this lily was obviously much too big to grow in a normal glass house. He began to think about more spacious accommodation inspired by the structure of the underneath of the lily leaf, which he said was a miracle of engineering all on its own. So he designed this structure to hold the glass roof up. He began with radial spokes like this going out, made out of wood, and then he had flexible ribs going round the outside to hold the spokes apart. He held them up on top of long poles, which actually were hollow and doubled as drain pipes. There were rafters to hold the glass up, on top of the glass, there were gutters to catch the rainwater, and underneath there were gutters to catch the condensation. Remember, it was hot water down here, so lots of condensation. Then he could get all the water back to where he wanted it. Brilliant idea, the whole thing, but the most brilliant thing of all was that all the bits were prefabricated. They were made somewhere else, and he just bolted them together on site. He designed the machines to make the parts, and soon they were being manufactured in their hundreds. In 1851, there was to be in London a great exhibition of the industry of all nations, and obviously they needed a special building for it. It had to be a building that could be built very quickly and then demolished again afterwards. And they invited designs from all over the country and 245 people sent designs in. Well, there was a judging panel which included the great railway engineers, George Stevenson and Isambard Kingdom Brunel and they rejected all 245 designs, just like that. And then they put in their own design. And rather understandably, it looked rather like a red brick railway station. And that was immediately thrown out by public outcry. So Paxton suggested he should put in a design and they gave him a couple of weeks. And in nine days, he had on their desks a superb version of his lily inspired greenhouse. It was absolutely wonderful, entirely made of cast iron and glass, a huge building. Although it was big enough to take 12 football pitches on the ground floor, it was going to cost only £80,000, which is incredibly simple. And because it was all built from parts, it could be bolted together on site, assembled very quickly, and then taken apart again very easily. So he got his thing accepted. Now the press hated it, and Punch in particular said, how can we accept this Crystal Palace? But the name stuck, and it's still called the Crystal Palace to this day. The public loved it, and the, the building was built, and the exhibition was put in, and it started in May, and then it ran for six months, and it was a colossal success. Six million people went to see the exhibition. And it made so much money, they built a mass of land south of the, of the park and built a whole lot of buildings on it. And Paxton became very famous and he was knighted and became Sir Joseph Paxton. Thank you. 
I'm the fact hungry witch. The answer, does good design prevail? The answer is unfortunately not always. In the case of the Crystal Palace, there was actually a, a convergence of factor. Paxton was very agile in promoting his ideas. He met the right people at the right time. And there was this public enthusiasm when the scheme was published in the newspaper. And that convergence does not always happen. And I, in some cases, actually, it's the worst design that prevailed. Hello, I'm the Fact Hungry Witch. I'm here with Antoine Picot. And I'm going to ask some questions to Antoine about the history of the Crystal Palace. The first question I'd like to ask you is, can you tell me what you know about the artisan glass processes in use at the Chance Brothers in comparison to the industrialized iron fabrication at Fox Henderson? Well, the interesting thing is, in a given period, you have things that are completely industrial and other that are still half artisanal. And mm -hmm. the glass is pretty much still artisanal, though produced so in massive I, quantities. I just interrupt you there because the word artisanal is hard. It's like artisan. Artisan, it's like being yes. made by hand. By hand, actually, with glass blowers who blow cylinders, which are then open and flattened. So it's still very much relying on people and, you know, on the, the so, lungs of people. And so all of the glass that was used in the Crystal Palace was actually made in this way? Absolutely, by the Chance Brother factory. So mm -hmm. you have a mix of completely industrial processes and things which are more, much more relying on traditional crafts. So interesting, because the iron had already become more industrialized. Yeah, iron yeah. had become more mass produced. Yeah, I will go to the next question. Um, so 3,230 columns, 2,300 girders. Is this a peak in the use of kit formulated construction? It is indeed, no uh -huh. doubt. It, at the time, you know, the building was really the first massive construction of its type. And also it's, it became quickly mythical because, you know, it was the first dry assemblage, you know, putting together mechano-like assemblage of things. So as a ballet, of productive forces, so That's fascinating the contemporaries. John Henderson suggested adding a central barrel vault to allow for the trees and it gave grandeur. This is not Paxton's idea. I find the sheer economy of Paxton's design really interesting. It's more box-like, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. it, it's in a way more modern. Uh, you know, Paxton wanted really the, 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 the Crystal Palace to be a very egalitarian structure, treating everybody on the same foot. And then the transept actually created a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, it also made for a more architectural quality. And you know, there was always this tension between non-architectural versus architectural in the whole and, story. And when you say non-architectural, can we call that engineering? Or is that not correct? Yeah, you could, mm -hmm. you could. Or, you know, in some ways, gardening, modern yes, gardening. Yes. Paxton was a strange mix of engineer, entrepreneur, gardener, a lot of things at the so same time. Also published journals. So quite a fascinating and character. I find the vault and the sort of um, upward pull, the vertical pull, really necessary because it makes it look so, um, in, in my mind, beautiful. But at the same time, when I took it away in my imagination and looked at this rectangular shape, I just found it so sheer and found it really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, you know, the initial scheme fascinated. It was published yes. and it fascinated the crowds. But, you know, strangely, in some ways, had it been realized like that, it would have been more Bauhaus-like. And, uh, and whereas, of, you know, the time. final building is a compromise. Uh, take one. Take, take one. Six, six. Today we find the use of iron totally normal in construction. We tend to forget, by the same token, that this was not the case prior to the 18th century. Iron was used mainly for machines, guns, for cannons, but certainly not in the very large quantities required for iron construction. This is, I'm quoting Antoine Picon, and I would love to ask Antoine in person to elaborate on this point. 
Well, I think the quotes, quotes say it all. You know, iron <laughs> used to be relatively scarce. You know, it was uh, expensive, hard to produce in large quantities. And then in the 18th century, through a series of innovation that actually starts at the very beginning of the 18th century, uh, England succeeds in making mass-producing cast iron. Mm -hmm. And this is going to change. And in, the, uh, in 1779, the first big bridge using cast iron is built. It's called Brookdale in mm -hmm. England. Mm -hmm. And then iron construction becomes a reality for mills and later for warehouses, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The Crystal Palace is actually inherits you know, more than half a century of experiments on the new material, construction material. Very interesting. This leads on to my next question, which I'm really excited about. The transition to use iron in the construction of bridges and glass houses is, is inspiring. I find the gradual build of confidence and knowledge interesting, especially in Joseph Paxton's case. Do you think it is exactly this type of development that needs to be in place for innovative engineering to take root? Probably, though, you know, innovation has very often different paths, but in the case of Paxton, it's a kind of network mm -hmm. of innovation. Mm -hmm. You know, he uses, for example, the large glass sheet of the great stove at Chatsworth. He then uses the furrow and ridges roof for, of the Lily uh, glass house. So a lot of things. It wouldn't have been possible also without the railway and, you know, the kind of co construction technology mobilized mm. for railways. So it's a kind of systemic innovation and Paxton is at the center of the system. The paint and design of the colors was very elaborate within the Crystal Palace. It's interesting in comparison to the economic constraint of the materials and structure. In relation to your extensive knowledge of history of architecture of ornament, does the effort made with the paint inspire a specific reaction from you? Well, a couple of reactions. The first is that, you know, this building was so extraordinary that the question of how to inhabit it, how to make it an interior mm -hmm. was at stake. And then there were hesitations, should one stress the immateriality of the structure or make it more material, more present? Mm -hmm. So after this first hesitation, which translated into white versus red, white more immaterial, red more material, they set for a complex scheme by Owen Jones. Is it possible to examine the effect of production and construction of the building without having to contemplate the burgeoning capitalism and pomp and glory of the royalty and empire that it housed? After the Great Exhibition, the Crystal Palace was taken down, piece by piece, and re-erected in Sydenham, where Paxton went to live. He became rich, famous, and an MP, and died in 1865. The Crystal Palace was then destroyed by a fire in 1936. The leaves of the Amazon water lily first appear as spiny heads poking out through the water, but expand rapidly across the water's surface, growing at a rate of up to 50 centimetres a day. On the red underside of the leaves, the ribs are covered in many sharp spines, a defence mechanism against fish and Amazonian manatees. 
Air trapped in the spaces between the ribs enables the leaves to float. The plant's enormous white flowers have a scent like pineapple. They open in the evening, giving off heat, which attracts pollinating beetles. They then turn a pale pink and close for the night. Isn't that Silva Federici's renowned Marxist feminist analysis of primitive accumulation, Caliban and the Witch? Yes. <laughs>